No, 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 no. We need to fix this one first. No, we ought to fix that one first. No, no, we need to fix this one first because in a lifetime of hunches, I'm usually right. That's often true, but this is the one that's generating emails from the VPs. <sighs> look, this alert is more unusual, right? So we have to look at this one because it could be something really weird. It happens all the time, you just ignore it. <laughs> Hey, what you guys arguing about? Well, we've got a critical issue here and we're kind of disagreeing about where to start. Yeah, noise can be overwhelming. I have a suggestion though. Mm -hmm. How about we use some data science to help us locate the signal through the noise? You had me at data. So when you talk about data, what do you mean, Carlo? Well, monitoring systems collect a wealth of data, but you can actually use mathematics to help humans make sense of where to begin. Ah, math and maybe some machine learning. And so we should assume anywhere there's machine learning and math that there's also probably APIs that we could use to go get the data. <laughs> you promise to wait till the end to talk about APIs? Fine. Okay, let's get started. I'm Thomas LaRock. I'm Carlo Zatilny. And I'm Patrick Hubbard, and welcome back to another episode of SolarWinds Lab. Okay, so a long, long time ago, in the cubicle far, far away, I built a thing. Was it any good? Uh, well, I thought so, yes. It was an alert for long-running SQL Server agent jobs. What did you define as long-running? That's a great question. So typical monitoring systems at the time, they used a default of 120 seconds as long. But that didn't work for me or my shop because, you know, for example, all of my database backup jobs would have been longer than 120 seconds. That's just two minutes. So I needed to build something better, smarter. So this is where you're gonna talk about your mathematics degree. Uh, two degrees, thanks. And on top of that, some extra Six Sigma training, just to be sure. But yeah, I decided to build something smarter. So I took the job, I took the data for job duration, which exists inside the MSDB database, and I built an alert that would notify me if a job was still running and if it was more than two sigmas beyond its 90-day rolling average. Ah, that would make a smarter alert. Mm. You wanted to identify anomalies, not just something that was running long. Exactly. Ah, so you found a way to get the signal through all the alerting noise. Yeah, and it was cutting edge at the time. Nobody was doing this. And that code actually made its way into DPA too. If you go into the alerts, and if you go into uh, the alerts and the administration alerts, you will find long-running SQL agent jobs. That's essentially the code I was using. But that method, as good as it is, you know, it doesn't take into account something like seasonalities. I was going to ask you about that. I was wondering how you knew how to do that at all or if you were filtering. And Carla, what do you mean by filtering? Well, let me show you. So algorithms are the foundation of machine learning. So today we're going to explain DPA and its algorithms that it's using for anomaly detection. Carla, that, that had no hype. It was just algorithms are the key. I'm going to show them to you. Yes, it's available now. It's out now. It's the latest release. It has machine. OK, enough. Yes. So uh, let's start drawing some information for you guys to analyze. So in DPA, what we found is that most of our customers have data. And that data is a squiggly line. And that squiggly line shows what your wait time and other data is doing. So with our double seasonal algorithm, we're breaking down that data into a variety of components Whoa. that allows us to predict the future. I'm sorry, double seasonal. Explain that. All right, double seasonal. So we're taking your raw data and we're breaking it down into components. The first component that we're breaking it down into is the general trend. So how is your data going? Is it trending up, trending down, flat? Also, we found that by analyzing a lot of our customer data and our own internal data, that there's a couple of seasonal components in addition to the trend. So we also have what we're calling the weekly trend. So generally, you start off low on Sunday, and then over the week, it's a little bit higher while everybody's at work, and then everybody goes home, and Saturday is low again. So we end up with this weekly trend as well. In addition to that, we find that everybody tends to have daily trends. Mm. So you run your nightly backup at night where you have a big spike, and then it comes down during the morning, and then it spikes up again while you have users in the office and back down when they go home. Hmm. So we have all of these different components of your data that allows us to understand how your users are using your system and ultimately what we can use to predict the future. So with these different components, we're then able to draw a component where we're able to look at your future data and add these components together to say, all right, what am I going to be doing at 
Friday, on Friday at 3 p.m. or Saturday at 5 p.m., what is my normal data look like? And with that prediction and with some general statistical analysis, we're able to like put some bands around that as well, where we have this range of what's normal and what we would consider anomalous. So statistical analysis, uh, any particular formula? Because this doesn't look like K means clustering, so what, what no. are we really doing here? Uh, an interesting thing that happens when you take raw data and you start subtracting these things like overall trend and seasonal components is that you end up with data that looks like your old school bell curve, if you remember Gauss and like that. So we end up with this normal distribution of the data so that we're able to give just normal standard deviation and mean statistical analysis to the data, which really helps us set standards for how many standard deviations away from the prediction could we expect your data range to be in. Mm -hmm. But you're saying, wait a minute, Carlo. That's not machine learning. That's not machine learning. That's not machine well, learning. Well, it's statistics. It's, it's the statistics. start. It's the start, but we need more algorithms because we need the machines to learn. So in DPA, what we've done is we've sent out uh, some students to start learning from your data. As DPA is out there analyzing the wait times of your different databases, it's going to look at its predictions, and it's going to say, my prediction is that spot right there, and all right, that's my prediction, but what was your actual real data coming in as? Was your real data above that, or was your real data below that? And so we're going to start rating ourselves on, all right, how good was my prediction? What was this range between my prediction and what the data actually was? And so the machine will say, oh, I had a good prediction or I had a bad prediction. On top of that, there's other algorithms in the back that are making different predictions. So we have other algorithms that might make predictions higher or lower than the double seasonal algorithm is doing. And it, they get rated as well as to how good they are compared to the actual. So if they're more accurate or less accurate, the machine will be able to use those different inputs and start to choose which of the algorithms are making the best predictions and then start to switch which of those predictions are doing it best and actually start to use the better predictions and that is machine learning. I like that analogy of students, right? Because we think always in terms of data, 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 but in this case, it's the agent, the uh, algorithm is a student that's actually analyzing. So it's that cooperation of the, the student plus the data. And, and this is happening in the background right now for the latest version of DPA. The students are actively doing this learning right now, but uh, the switching between algorithms mm -hmm. isn't there yet. We're just, Correct. we're just gathering the data. We're doing the math. Yeah, we're doing the math right now. We want to understand the confidence of what we're going to actually be releasing in the future. And so right now, we just have the students out there learning. We're also gathering data through the uh, SolarWinds Improvement Program in order to understand what our customers are seeing. So we're going to be doing some learning here at SolarWinds headquarters to understand how are our algorithms doing and how are we going to be able to make them better in the future. So the stuff on the left side of the screen here, this is really what goes into the anomaly detection part. Is that correct? correct? Yes. Okay. So, and that's the last thing you draw on the, the Gauss and you're saying, I, I think what we have for defined as something, if it's critical, if it's more than three sigmas away? Correct. Yeah. Today we're doing two sigmas away for warning and three sigmas away for critical. So three sigmas, that's 98%. So if you're within six sigmas of the uh, standard deviation, that you're basically we're saying 98% of everything should fall in there. So if you're Correct. outside of that, that's an outlier. That's yes. the anomaly. Correct. Okay. And we're able to make that uh, confident because of the methodology that we're using and it's got some mathematical soundness behind it. Well, what I like is the, the first thing you had over here was basically basic linear regression. Am I trending up or down over time, right? That's everybody's, that's done capacity planning. That's always the question. But what I like is you had this drawing here of, of this was uh, for the week. For the weekly. And this yeah. was for the daily because Correct. a lot of tools end up giving you just that view of, and not just, um, not just a tool, a database tool, but I'm just saying in general, like whenever I had to talk to somebody that ran a SAN, it was always an average. It was always, well, here's this, and this is what it looks like for a long period of time. I'm like, no, I'm having trouble at this moment. And they're like, well, nothing's showing up in our reports because it's all been smoothed out. Right. So they're never getting that level of granularity that a database tool will give you. So this is almost a blend of we have some granularity going on and we also have some smoothing. And we are getting a better idea of 
is this really a problem? Right, and that was key with working with our data science team was us looking at all of the different algorithms that are available for today in today's uh, machine learning realm and saying, all right, which of these algorithms is best fitting our customers' data? So there are algorithms that are just general smoothing or using one level of seasonality for prediction, but by getting the overall trend and two uh, levels of seasonality, we're able to make the best prediction. So in our testing, this algorithm ended up being the best in being able to predict the most data sets future. Now there's definitely other sets of data that will not be able to be predicted accurately, but because of our testing in-house, we found that this algorithm is actually one of the better ones for doing that. So what I love about this, getting into DPA mostly, is especially if you've integrated with Orion, right? This will show up as a, uh, a per, in perf stack. It'll be there, and it'll be anomaly. So if you're a, a network admin or just a server admin, but you're using Orion in general, you're going to be able to answer that question, is this really a problem? You're going to have it on the dashboard, and you're going to know, yeah, I really need to tell the DBA to do some work this time. Instead of just thinking you should blame the database, because most people do, you'll know if it's truly a problem to look at because it's an anomaly, or if it's just performance has always been horrible. You're going to have that insight like that. Instead of just hoping the DBA is going to finally fix it, like you'll be able to say, no, no, it's truly an anomaly. You should go to work now. Right. Yeah. Well, and not to oversimplify, but part of it too is, you know, it's to solve that problem of creating these ever more specific alert conditions and thresholds and the rest of it, is that these are learning thresholds that are also able to project into the future. So it's, uh, it's, not, it's, it's a different approach, but it's a little bit analogous to uh, uh, NetPath, right? Where it would be impossible to set thresholds on the internet. So <laughs> the data science there is calculating what is red or yellow mm -hmm. or what is normal, right? Yeah. So again, it's to get away from that, process, that, that expectation that you were going to create these rules with ever greater levels of specificity that are going to finally figure out what the problem is. Yeah, and that leads to a great point that we're moving this into DPA first because we've found through our own research that the database is such a critical component of many applications. We are running computers, we are running networks just so that we can run these applications and the database is that standard application that everybody has that when an anomaly happens there, it tends to flow upstream, that the website is now slow because of the database and all of these other components are slow if the database is suffering. So by putting anomaly detection in DPA first, we're actually setting the frame for our ability to bump that out into the other products so that we're able to have anomaly detection across the board and give you the full power of machine learning throughout all of our suite of products. So what I love about all that is a lot of times you hear companies, machine learning, AI, there's a lot of hype. And when you're just, a, just little a little bit, team. but when you start asking questions about it, AI can be nothing more than an if then else statement, because the, technically that fits the definition of what AI is. So when you hear companies say AI machine learning technology, sometimes it's just rules-based recommendations. It's not really, we're using math. We have real math going on here. We have actual data science happening and if and when this gets into a broader set of products, uh, we're going to get that signal through the noise to you. And I'm just so excited about all of this. Wasn't part of that, I mean, that it's the answer, to the, it's the unintended answer to the unexpected question, which is step one, get all of your data, collect all of the data. Yeah. Then data science is the first answer to, okay, we have too much data and it's impossible to figure out what's actually meaningful here. And then once you can actually get that into, into a form that can be digested, then machine learning is a technique that can be applied on top of that. Yes. Right, and the advantage of machine learning and AI, again, is that it builds on top of each other. So once you have one algorithm, its output can then be used by an al other algorithm, and you allow the machine to make those choices of which algorithms it's gonna use to build on top of each other. And then you have the system that is tailored to your specific environment, to your specific needs, because the machine is actually making those decisions for us based off of the mathematical principles that we're bringing. Do you find that it's able, that the, the breadth of the data that's collected actually uh, really contributes to the ability for machine learning to find unexpected insight? Absolutely, so the more data that we have, the better able we're to we're able to look better for those anomalies and for those patterns. And so the more data that we're able to look at, the better we're going to be able to be at finding that needle in the haystack or finding the root cause. So the direction is absolutely for us to go to 
the world where we're looking at all of your data and just ultimately finding you know, what happened first? What was the key change within your environment that actually caused this trigger of poor performance or loss of connection or whatever? That really odd root uh, cause that you would have never expected because it's the relationship of the database, virtualization, and storage. Exactly. So the power here is the simplicity as well because you're talking about all the data being collected. Data is the fuel for this machine in the machine learning. So you want the right data. This is the important part, because a lot of times people will just collect everything, collect all the metrics. Surely there's some insights in all of this. But the thing is, if you're not collecting the data to help answer the question, in this case, I need to know if my wait response time is an anomaly or not. OK, do we have the data for all the weights? Well, yes, we do. What, you care about weight? So, so we have the fuel for this machine. That's not always the case either. There are times where you'll look and say, look, you got way too much data, and you're actually not getting the answers you need out of this. It's, just, it's almost too many variables for you. Right. So this, a, a database weight stats, is like the perfect machine learning experiment, if you will, that you want to do because you know what data to collect, you know what data to analyze, you know what data to feed into the machine in order to make things a little bit better. So it, it's not just this, hey, you know, throw everything under into here and get an answer out of it. It's, it's a very specific thing. So it's sort of uh, why gravity, right? Like yeah. in this case of something that's really hard to diagnose, lots of why, 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 lots of, lots of theories and trying to actually sort that out. You're saying that that's what should attract uh, machine learning to where there are lots and lots of whys and lots of disagreement about what the cause could be. Yeah, and ultimately we're able to use the machine learning to help you find that uh, useless information as well. So the machines are actually looking at your vast amounts of data and saying, actually, this one's not useful. Yeah, not really. So there's no correlation. Right. It's not, this one isn't as relevant. Yeah, yeah so we have this detector. idea of, of, of golden metrics that you may, may have heard of. These are the important things to look at. We at SolarWinds have that experience. We've been monitoring for years. We know what things to look at. You know, we want to look at things when they're slow. What makes things slow? We know those key performance counters that let us know that information. So that's where we're focusing our machine learning on as well, is that we're able to filter through all of that vast amounts of data and only focus on the key points like database wait time. So uh, I think the way I've been doing that is uh, hyperparameters. Is that s similar to what we're, is that the method that we're doing for that? Or? Uh, yeah, hyperparameters and just being able to do comparative uh, analysis on the different time series. So we're actually okay. able to do uh, deltas and differences between different time series to say how far apart are these different time series from like a Cartesian sort of standpoint or a Pearson co coefficient standpoint. And with that, we're able to say, all right, these ones are significant, these ones are insignificant. So you take the machine learning on top of the expertise that we bring as monitoring experts. And that combination is really what will drive us towards the future of even automated uh, responses where we're able to learn that this configuration change caused the problem within your environment. We see anomalies after that configuration change. Do you know what you should do? You should go back and change that configuration to something or Joe Bob, he made the configuration change. You should go ask him why he made that change. Because Joe Bob is the anomaly? Yes. Yeah, Joe. <laughs> Often you have an anomalous uh, employee but within your system. Think of the world you're in, though. What you're talking about now is uh, a world of desired state configuration as well, on top of this, where you're saying, oh, you made this change, and I can tell it was a bad thing. Let me go back. Because right now, desired state is more like, oh, I just see you're not in the right configuration thing. Imagine if I know you're not the same, but you might be better. Or if you get worse, I'll roll you back. This is, that's, you're going to change how we do IT operations. Yeah, absolutely. That's the goal. And Carlo, you said something interesting, which was you've looked at a lot of customer data. And you know, many of you are you know, the regular viewers of SolarWinds Lab are also really heavily involved in THWACK, our user community, and our UX programs and uh, RC programs. So you did work with a number of customers with a lot of different types of data, right? Yeah, fortunately, our customers at SolarWinds are really friendly, and they're uh, able to share us anonymous data. And we were able to take that anonymous data and run our different uh, data science and machine learning algorithms against. So a big thanks to our users out there for sharing your data with us. Uh, you have made the machine learning in uh, DPA and other products much, much better because of it. 
Oh, hey, before I forget, and I, I love just looking at graphs and dots and lines and all that. Some of the lines are straight. And they're some, orange. And, some, and they're orange. This is all great. But you know what we really should show them? It's how this looks inside of Orion. The, we just show them perf stack and DPA. Because it's really complicated and it's really hard to understand. So. Yeah, no, it's not that hard. All right, even, let's see. Even you'll understand it. Okay, so what we have, what Carla has in front of him here is Orion. And we've integrated this particular database server, right, using DPA IM, right? We've integrated DPA and Orion together. And so now you're going to get this lovely new wait time status inside of your perf stack. So if you're building a nice perf stack dashboard report and now you're wondering, hey, tell me something about the actual database server here. I want to know if there's an anomaly with regard to the wait time status. Yeah, and that's Carla, the can, beauty of sorry. it. No problem. So we tried to make this, per uh, Patrick's comment earlier, as complex as, prob as possible. Mm. Uh, so what we have here is the different statuses of the database as it goes throughout time. And here you see there was a red status and a yellow status. And these are the anomalies that we're detecting. These are the key indicators that you'll just be able to come in, look at this chart and say, where it's yellow, this is where we're at that uh, two sigma threshold of warning. And where it's red, that's where we've detected a critical anomaly that we believe is atypical for your environment. So there could be some anomalies sprinkled all along the green line, but these are the particular ones that the machine learning has identified are important. Exactly. And so what this allows you to do is quickly find a point in time on the perf stack chart of what an anomaly or when an anomaly happened and then ultimately what other, what other things were going on within your so, environment. So normal, uh, if you look at this top, the total instance wait time that you're looking at on the top, right? You see you got bigger bars, and usually we tell people big bar means bad, right? So, but here's the thing, I've got an anomaly. I've got something red on one of the shorter bars. Something was different at that point in time, but if you look at the overall trend, it would be hidden. Yeah, and that's the beauty of the machine learning is that it's learned that low is normal for that point in time of that part of your season or that part of your day or that part of your week. And because it was expecting low, it sees high, that's anomalous. So an anomaly might be triggered on a bar that's not as high as the rest of them, mm -hmm. but because it's strange for that particular time, that's what makes it the anomaly. Now, how does it look in DPA? Excellent question. Let's jump over to DPA and take a look at some of the great charts within Database Performance Analyzer that show you the anomalies as well. So here you see a classic DPA wait time chart that you are all familiar with, with the different queries and how much wait time we're seeing. And we've added below a new chart that shows you what those anomalies are and when they're happening. So zero in this chart is basically what we're predicting. We're predicting uh, a specific value for this particular uh, point in time, and then the green is how much above or below you are for that particular time, and if it goes too high above or even potentially too far below, that's an anomaly for your point in time. So here you see uh, within this particular bar, green ends at this point, and uh, yellow is then a small portion of that, so we have a, a fairly small standard deviation, and then anything above that is going to be red. And yeah. that width changes throughout time, so you see that each of these yellow and red bars can happen at different levels depending on the time of day. But this is, good. This is showing me an aggregate, so this is all the queries. So basically, out of 14, 15 hours of wait, you know, 10 of it was normal, an hour and 42 was in the warning range, and three, you had three hours worth of queries that were, that were anomalous. Correct. So that could be one query, it could be 100 queries. Yeah, yep. and that's what's going to point you to dive into the detailed data and actually find out what was going on at that point in time. Was it one particular query? Were you running hundreds of little queries that add up to your uh, wait time? And that's the, the finger pointing that we're trying to do here. So there's a ton of deviation data here. So why not use whisker charts, for example? Uh, that's a great question. So we tested a bunch of different user experience uh, charts with lots of the users out there in uh, SolarWinds land. And this was the feedback that we got, that this was the easiest to understand, that you come in, you look at this chart, there's red, that means it's bad, there's yellow, that means it's almost bad, green is good. So this chart actually tested best with our users. And I noticed you have this green one way low, but it's not red. It's not 
I don't think we do critical for things that are really low. Correct. For this version, we decided that we're going to allow everything that is too low to just be green, that when your database is performing OK and there's less wait time, that's not as critical as higher wait time. Okay. So it's definitely in our future where we could start showing uh, too low of predictions are anomalies, but today we are showing only high thresholds as the true anomalies. No one has ever complained that anomalies are low, so yeah. that's okay. Nobody, nobody has ever complained that the database or the website is too fast. But I'm going to move off it just for a second just to show, but you see on that day, it looks like maybe somebody turned the server off. So, yeah, that could be, that's a different anomaly, but yeah. this, is, this is where we're heading with the tools, is the understanding of what's really causing it. So in the future, we might see this and then be smart enough to say, hey, uh, something's really different here. Was the server even on? And yeah. we have all the data through all the different products, so we're going to be able to get to that point of giving you that intelligence. Right. But when the first time I saw this, I was almost, I don't want to say disappointed, but I, I'm, you know, usually uh, deviation and kind of calculation methods and the algorithm that's producing the data are presented as part of the chart. And at first I was like, well, this is just green, yellow, red. It's to draw my attention to there's a problem. And then I thought about it. I'm like, no, if, if you put all of the deviation data and everything else up here, and then you use that data to figure out its anomaly, that's not machine learning. That's human learning. Yeah. So the whole point is that it should be able to produce at a glance. It is telling, it's doing the work of telling you that that thing is an unusual circumstance that you need to pay attention to. R remember what I always say. DPA gives you charts that even managers can understand. Yeah. We like managers. I've yet to have anybody in the meeting just say, I don't understand what the bar chart is communicating to me. So what you said is true. People, especially data science people, they want the formulas, they want all the math and all that. But this isn't built for necessarily a data scientist to use. This is built for a network administrator to say, I really need to call somebody, or it's always been that way, or why is the server or off? Or I just want to solve it and go on to the I next. I just want to solve it and I have to move on to the next one. Right. It's bar charts. Okay, there is clearly a ton of data here. Yeah. And it would be nice to be able to get at it, right? Mm -hmm. And DPA and uh, the Orion platform have had APIs for a really long time. So what I'd like to show is how to actually combine this data into something that's useful and to use some automation to be able to get this kind of data automatically from DPA, maybe if you weren't already monitoring it. All right. Does that sound cool? Yeah, take All over right. the driver's seat. Okay, so I'm tempted to call this segment, if it had a title, uh, two APIs and a command line tool. Oh, maybe not. Okay, or maybe not, all right? But uh, so here, we'll sort of set this up. Here I'm, I'm, I'm inside of SAM, and I'm using the app inside for SQL, and I'm monitoring a SQL server, right? Okay. And I've got all of my metrics that are coming back, yep. and you can tell that some of these detailed, some of these metrics have a lot more detail, and mostly you can tell that it's integrated with DPA, because over here on the left side, it sees DP performance monitor, right? Yeah. So it knows about it, it's passing mm -hmm. data back and forth, and then over here, I've got the detail view, so if I had drilled into the native mm -hmm. DPA uh, console, uh, I would see the, the detailed information and the main thing that I'm going to be trying to solve is a wait time issue, right? Okay. So here's the story. Let's just say that you have 5,000 databases. Or, I have 5,000 databases. Or, or 10,000. I have 5,001. Oh. Or some number in of databases that you would like to monitor occasionally with DPA, but in general, as long as they're behaving, if you're not messing with them and their resources aren't changing, you can kind of leave them alone and just let Sam monitor them, right? So okay. maybe you have a, a developer who's working on it or you're transitioning that database from one place to another or pushing it to the cloud where you need to have monitoring. So the story here is I'm monitoring a series of nodes inside of SAM, mm -hmm. and one of the things that I'm not doing is DPA monitoring on all of them, right? Because I'm trying to kind of manage the number, number of instances that I'm watching with DPA. Yeah. So that machine that we were looking at here, the one that's expanded on this uh, when, uh, for our queue box, is um, just a uh, regular uh, machine. But I've got this other one out here, this Win99Q, and I really, I know SQL Server is running on that box, and I'm monitoring it, but let's just say maybe I go into 90% CPU utilization for an hour. Hmm. And what I'd really like to do is start monitoring that in depth with DPA, because I really do want to trigger, figure out what the problem is, because the database can give that to me. So there's two different APIs here. So one, I mean, we've talked many, many times about the SolarWinds SDK and working with uh, Swickle and Swiss, but DPA also has an API underneath it, which can do magical things. Mm -hmm. So here's a story. We'll set this up. So uh, we have a, we'll say if a server that is running, that we're monitoring, is running SQL Server, and it pegs 
rig is out for 90% for more than an hour, I want to automatically apply, add that instance to DPA. So I'm going to do that with the database. I'm going to do that with database, and I'm going to do that with the API. So the first thing to note is that when you are inside of DPA, it's a little bit different. Remember, we have for the Orion platform at Swickle Studio, there are thousands and thousands of elements on hundreds of different objects that you can work with, or, or dozens, depending on how many modules you have installed. Mm -hmm. um, but the point there is that Orion, the Orion platform is pulling all of those things together. It is the thing that is the glue that allows you to connect all of those mm -hmm. disparate data sources. But in the case of a database, the API can be a lot simpler because everything is inside the database for the most part. The database knows what's going on, but it's pretty much a black box compared to everything that you're separately monitoring across your environment with the Orion platform, which okay. makes it easier to get at it. Right. So the trick, though, is how do I glue those two things together, and how do I do it in a way where I'm not just, every time an alert fires, going and applying DPA monitors to everything. So here's how we do that. So the first thing is, uh, you've seen Swickle Studio. I'm not going to cover that again. And I'm not going to, this is not a programming uh, class by any means. So we'll try to get through this really quickly. I just want to show you what's possible. So I'm looking here inside of DPA. So uh, instead of using the Swickle Studio, I'm going to go to Options. And the first thing you're going to notice down here, well, I'm going to scroll down to it, is Management API Documentation. Yep. So let's click on Management API Documentation, and we go to Swagger. Swagger. What is Swagger? You've got some Swagger. You've got Swagger. Right. Yeah. Swagger is a miraculous self-documenting API technology. Mm. Uh, well, not completely self-documenting, but for you, it means that you're not looking at documents back and forth, and that you can run things in real time. So uh, the cool thing about this is it can do things like this access token API thing. This is mm -hmm. OAuth. And then there's a management API, which is what we're going to be using here in a second. So I'll show you how you can walk through and see how this works instead of you're not using Swickle Studio, right? So the, um, if I'm going to click on the management API here, and you can see that there's sort of uh, five main categories of calls that you can make. Um, you can get data about annotations. You can um, manage the monitor database instances. Um, you can register new databases. And um, then there's um, API logging as well. And the ones that we're going to focus on is actually database registration mm -hmm. and database monitoring. Okay. So the way that this works, is it's based on a token. Because with the uh, Swiss API, it's a username and a password. Mm -hmm. In this case, it's a token, and it's using OAuth. So the first step is I need an access token. Right. So remember, the DPA's uh, API is based on a refresh token. So that's something that you get out of the UI, or you ask an administrator to give you, and then you can access it. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to expand this. Uh, first uh, uh, REST API. So essentially, it's saying access token is a service. I have several different things I can do on it. In this case, it's a post, right? So I'm going to say try it out. And then it's going to ask me for my refresh token, which we just grabbed from the uh, administrator, sent it to me. And I'm going to say execute. Here's the curl that executed to go get that, mm -hmm. the, the URL so that I can confirm it. And then here's my access token. And so the, the first thing to note is that the API is going to work for you just like it is in Swagger. So whatever you do here in terms of testing will also work when you implement it regardless of the language that you're using for that script. Now, I'm sorry, there was a timeout there, 899. That's the fault, 900 seconds for every access token? or. Uh, it is never going to expire. Uh, the, well, let me rephrase it. That's a great question. So there's two elements. There's the refresh token, which you can set, set to expire or not expire. Right. Or if you're concerned that somebody's using it, you can kill the uh, refresh tokens, and then they'll have to get another one. But in this case, that's the default, I think, for right. the access token. So the access token has a lifespan. It has a lifespan. The refresh token may not, but the access token will. And that's not a part of DPA. That's just OAuth. That's right. Right. So I've got my, I've got my uh, token, and it's going to automatically save that for me. Yep. So then the next thing is we're going to come to our specification for the management API. This is the part that's being provided by the DPA REST. Mm -hmm. And for database monitor, for example, if I wanted to get information about all the database instances, the information that's, that's available as a part of that, a part of that API. So then how do I use it? So there's a couple of great examples that are, uh, that are out there. And uh, this, this one actually comes from a, a Thwack user, mm -hmm. right? So, so PowerShell, of course, our friend. So let's take a look at a couple of these. Um, this first one here, this uh, DPA API, that's going to go and get information about the uh, databases that it's monitoring, right? Right, for that instance. That's right. OK, so we'll just execute it and see what that looks like. No. 
LS will not execute it. That's true, that wouldn't. So let's try again and actually <laughs> execute that first one. And you can see here that the first thing that it did was it used the access token That's provided, right. right? So we've got that stored somewhere, hopefully in a secure place. Uh, we use the access token, uh, the, the refresh token, to get the access token, and then the script went out and hit the API, yeah. the same one that we saw with the same URLs uh, back in Swagger, and then here's all the databases that are running, right? Mm -hmm. the, that it's monitoring, and then if there's information about them. But now you were talking about annotations the other day. I was. And that one is much more interesting. So let's take a look at this annotations one here. Yeah, so, an, so annotation was this great feature that we added to DPA years ago where essentially if there was a spike in performance, a change, you'd want to say, oh yeah, but um, you know, we pushed something to test then or whatever. Or you just want to make, you want to make an annotation inside of DPA so somebody knows what the spike was really all about. It's basically writing a note to future you. Right? right? That's how I always put it. So that's annotations, though, is some of the information we can get from the new API. That's right. So that was added in this latest release. So here's a script that's actually going to go out and do the same thing. And look at that. Right. So if you were wondering, you know, when did I do that? I know I had an annotation. Can I just quickly see all that? Yes. Mm -hmm. And pull it into another system. Right. So let's combine these all into one single thing. So remember, Swagger is your friend. You're not looking at a separate tool and documentation. It's all t uh, together. It's especially handy if you're running this in uh, Azure, for example, mm -hmm. or in a cloud instance. Um, so the way that we're going to do this is I'm going to fire an alert, and I'm going to call something that's going to do something magical, right? OK. But I want to make sure that, one, am I already monitoring it? Is it already monitored by DPA? Mm -hmm. Two, does it have SQL Server on the box at all? Mm -hmm. And then if it does, is that already uh, monitored by an instance if once we know some things about it, like its IP address? Like okay. we should probably check with both DPA and Orion if we're already monitoring it. And then if not, then we're going to apply monitoring. Sort of make sure that it's safe, right? OK, I'm with you. So we're going to tie all those things together. So we're going to start with an alert, because mm -hmm. that's what's actually going to tell us that we've reached a uh, certain uh, CPU threshold. And we'll just use the summary view. I love this. Summary view. It's just mm, so, so handy. useful. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's you know. It lets you know. So this was the Auto Deep Monitor uh, SQL uh, with DPA, right? Mm -hmm. So it's gonna. I'm just kind of going through the description. The rest of it. It's gonna run once a minute, and it's got a uh, trigger condition, which is if the CPU load is greater than 90%, mm -hmm. and the trigger action is going to be run this safe add DPA executable. That's Ooh. not a script. And who wrote that? That's but it's safe. It says it right in the it, name. It is. <laughs> but it's also Go. So we're gonna we're gonna show you how that works here in a second. But if you click on what this on how this is configured, and we are gonna go down here into the uh, edit action, you can see that it's it's executing an ex external program. I'm not automatically resetting it, and because if that has happened, you want to know and be able to clear that yourself. So it's gonna execute that. Uh, executable, and then I'm passing in a uh, command line parameter, which is node ID, and I'm using the variable insert to just add that. So that's a Swiss query that's getting the node ID and plopping it in there, and then it's executing that executable. And it means, do you see passwords? Usernames? It's probably in the script, right? It's not in the script, because that would be naughty. It is in the code. Okay. So this is actually Go. And before that, let's go back to that script that we saw before, uh, the one that goes out and gets, this is the uh, PowerShell script that we, that we mm -hmm. executed first, right, to go and get the uh, database instances that were being monitored. Uh, this one, wow, that really actually does have the refresh token in it. It kind of does have that refresh. That's, that's a hard-coded SA password. Came right off with WAC, so yeah. thanks. Appreciate yeah. that. That's good. Uh, so here you can see the sections, right? It's, it's, so again, PowerShell, we're going out, we're getting the uh, API token that's that we right. need. Then using that, we pass that in, then execute the query to get the databases monitor uh, uh, information. That then calls this invoke method and that returns the data. And, and one thing that the author did here that was really handy is they put these little snippets of what the, data, the right, data what should look, look like. like. Yeah. That is just really handy and very, very good form. Comments um, are always valuable. Right. But so we're following that same form, right? We're going to get the token, and then we're going to go out and get the, get the data. It's a little bit different in our Go program, because we're going to do a couple of things, right? So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to say, um, is go get all the instances of uh, DPA, and mm. then uh, do we have a related instance? Because we're, we're passing this in again from the alert that, that, uh, that Orion is calling, right? So we're passing in the alert ID and uh, whether or not it's a debug. And I definitely recommend wherever possible that you use, in this case, flags for Go, use named parameters for any other scripting language in PowerShell because you know parameters mm -hmm. get mixed up and you won't remember what works and what didn't later on. Um, so it's for node ID, does it have a DPA instance? Because we can okay. ask Orion that because it has the relationship. 
relationship. Remember mm -hmm. before the icon with the database button on the left-hand side? So if it's already being monitored, we don't want to add monitoring. No. Right? So then the second thing is, does it have SQL Server running on it? So for that, we're going to do, we're going to go get a process list. Didn't know you could do that, did you? Uh, and then <laughs> after mm. that, if we find SQL Server, then we'll go and ask, hey, based on this IP address, are you sure you're not monitoring? And then if not, add the instance. So what that looks like is, and I'll, I'll, run through, I'll run through this a couple of times, but the magic between this, the bridge between the two is that process list. We need to know whether it's actually running on the machine or not. So rather than creating another script, you know inside of Orion there are all of these executables and other things that are deep down in the program files yeah. directory. Well, there's one in here that's kind of handy. So this is uh, program files, SolarWinds Orion APM is real-time process polar. Now, hmm. I suspect you can tell me, is this the back end of the pop-up real-time process viewer on the front page? It may well be, but you can use it from the command line too, and it'll go out and pull all the processes off the box. So here's how that works. The code actually executes. Go get the, go get the list of uh, processes that are running, and then it runs through them. It'll iterate through that, and if it finds SQL Server, then it's going to return true. If it doesn't, it won't. All right, so we'll come back over here to our main. I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and start this. I'm gonna use the, I'll use the debugger and then we can just walk through it, and uh, we'll run this and see what happens in our in our console. All right. So we went out. We got the bearer token that we came mm -hmm. back for. Right. We went and this is this is a a Swickle query okay. that's running on the Orion API, and then we looked through it and it says. Ah, yes, look at that. We do, in fact, for this server, have a known, um, a known instance of DPA. And we got that because the Swickle query lets us do that. Remember, we, you have those dot, and it, those, uh, dot joined uh, values so you don't have to do joins. So this is, I'm selecting from uh, Orion DPA database instance, mm -hmm. but I'm getting the application reference application node node ID. Right? And again, okay. this is documented inside the Orion uh, API. So, this is, so that's what Orion gives us. So then we're going to go out and we're going to get our process list. So this time we'll run it again, but we're going to do it for this other node. So we're going to run this again out of our debugger. You can see that we're getting the process list, so it didn't mm -hmm. find it. So now it's actually using that command line argument to go get the list of processes. Here's the list of all the processes that are running. And sure, SQL Server is running on that node, mm. right? So again, I'm just reusing the get token every time because mm. if you occasionally use it, it's just easier just to go get it unless you're doing it all the time yeah. because you don't have to worry about it expiring. So now I'm asking DPA, hey, are you monitoring it? Here's all the data that came back from DPA about monitored instance. And it says, oh, you know what? You're right. That's not a, a server that DPA knows anything about. So I've determined that SQL Server is running on the box using the Orion API. I figured out that it is definitely not being monitored individually by DPA. and then it went out and then added the monitoring instance by essentially setting a set of parameters in this, uh, this uh, DPA class, and it's passing in a couple of things. Mo a lot of these for SQL Server are ignored, so I've kind of trimmed it down. So this one is basically saying I'm adding a SQL Server, uh, the host name that's being passed in as a part of that, uh, that we collected through that API, and then you asked before about credentials. Mm -hmm. I've just got a little class here, uh, the secret class, which knows how to go out and get um, secrets that are stored on that machine so that they're encrypted and nobody can get access to them. So that's about it for the API. You know, it's kind of interesting to think about the driver behind the decision to release this in SolarWinds products now, uh, and then the difference between what IT uh, executives expect, or maybe just believe, and what technologists actually need. Yeah, right. I was surprised at the reaction that when we demoed this at Tech Field Day, one of the delegates tweeted, SolarWinds was the first vendor he's seen that actually explained how machine learning relates to operations, rather than being a marketing term. But really, is that a surprise? Don't talk about the IT Trends Report. The IT Trends Report 2019. <laughs> and what was the top trend of interest for executives? Mm, AI and machine learning? Exactly. Exactly. Okay, that's true, but the survey includes admins and execs. So the real message this year, to me anyway, is that it's time to learn more about AI and ML and even deep learning and understand how it might apply to your day-to-day -day operations rather than planning to add machine intelligence to everything that you do before New Year's. 
But didn't it say something about containers as well in 2018? That's true, and that might actually be the most valuable bit. The Trends Report has been running for several years now, and it's more valuable viewed over time than in any single year. So, for example, we watched containers go from, we haven't heard about it, to it's bleeding edge, it's overhyped, and now you all are telling us, well, yeah, nah. man, it's just one more thing that you do. Yeah, but containers didn't go away. No, they went from an executive priority to just another tool used by IT, not just developers in cloud. Yeah. Right, because measuring uh, future versus reality over time lets us diff out admin needs versus executive interest, and it also lets us call out periods of disconnect. It's also global so that we can see the differences between regions. Well, it's data, and it's all about the data. Yeah, so check it out and let us know if you find it useful. It's it-trends.solarwinds.com. Hyphen? Yeah, back when we started doing it, hyphens were not shameful. Now, I blame DevOps. Uh, we'll put the link in the notes. And I don't know if I'm happier to see anomaly detection added to DPA or that machine learning might be coming to other SolarWinds products in the future. It's going to change how we do IT ops, right? But in a good way. Uh, I've been wondering, do you ever think that data science in general will solve the real questions that is facing humanity? You mean like uh, world hunger or global warming? Well, not just those, but I'm also I'm concerned about things like, is this a picture of a cat or a croissant? Or what about, is this a chihuahua or blueberry muffin? So would you settle for knowing what kind of dog you are? I would. Awesome. Okay, well then let's wrap with that. And just as a reminder, if you don't see the chat box over here to your right, it's because you're not with us live. So swing by our homepage, which is lab.solowinds.com, check out upcoming show dates, and bring your questions. Is that about it? Yes, sir. For SolarWinds Lab, I'm Thomas LaRock. I'm Carlos Zatilni. And I'm Patrick Hubbard, and thanks for watching.